Ja, das ist gut. Ja, ja. Ja, 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 ja. das ist die Show. Ja, das ist Willkommen. Show. Willkommen, willkommen. Hey. I don't know any German. We should, we should do an entire show in German just to confuse our listeners. Oh, well, it's like, as if they're not confused enough when they turn on our episodes, but <laughs> they just ima <laughs> imagine they, they, they start playing an, an episode of the podcast and it's like, wait, is this dubbed? <laughs> Did I accidentally download it from a German server or something? What, what's going Why on? Why do they sound so angry? <laughs> <laughs> And yet oddly attractive with their deep voices. Well, attractive. In that, that is trans our good looks absolutely transcends the language. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Welcome, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Science Actually Presents the Nerd and the Scientist, um, where today we are unfortunately not discussing whether or not we could uh, upload a transcript uh, of uh, an episode into some AI generated tool and generate uh, some sort of amazing German episode. But instead, we are going to be talking about learning, um, not machine learning, but human learning. I like that. I think. Yes. Yes, indeed. How do you feel about learning, Benjamin? Um, I like it. I am a big supporter of learning. Um, I am a learning addict of all the hobbies a person can assign themselves. Building model trains or going out into the woods and hugging trees or, you know, painting or whatever. I assign myself homework, hence science, actually. I just like learning new stuff, and hmm. I find it, eh, what's the saying that I, I, I annoy my kids with? Uh, a, a day you didn't learn something is a wasted day. Mm, so I like it's that. important to learn new stuff. Didn't learn something. What do you think about That's learning? That's really cool. <laughs> I think... I think that my attitude to, to learning now as an adult or allegedly an adult is very different to what it was when I was a kid. Because when I was a kid, I was just like, I was interested in things. I never thought that I had a particular thirst for knowledge. But in hindsight, like I was always interested in like learning about a bunch of different topics and, and deepening my knowledge. And I think that, you know, what it, it kind of reminds me of... Um, did you ever have that that stage when you were like burning DVDs, right? You were, or like you were you like compiling a movie collection, right? At one right. point, most of us over a certain age were compiling a collection of digital media because we had to have everything, right? <laughs> but then, right. at a certain point, there was just too much media for us to to store. The storage costs would, would have been absurd. And it's unreasonable because you can stream everything. I think, you know, back then it was maybe streaming or torrenting was, you know, frowned upon. And nowadays you can do all of that stuff legally. And that's that's the way that people do it. And I think mm -hmm. that I feel kind of similarly about learning. I maybe went through a phase where I was trying to to store knowledge in some sort of way. And now I just accept that it's more about learning learning how to access knowledge when I need it from various sources rather than trying to store everything in my old uh, noodle, you know? Noggin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the Zinagin. Yeah. That, that, that's what I think about learning. I think it's great. It helps, uh, helps you better understand the world that you're in. It's, uh, <clears throat> I like trying to, uh, how do I put this? I like to try, uh, like some people get an earworm in their head and it's a mm -hmm. tune and they can't get it out of that head until they figure out what that song is. And now their, their mind is at rest. Same thing for me, but not with songs, but so much. Um, I'll see a science headline or something like that. And it says such and such a thing is 
moving at such and such a speed and I need to understand what that speed is. We kind of talked about that in a previous episode, astronomical figures and such. And mm -hmm. they talk about speeds of, and great distances. And you can't, unless you're like you, it's your profession to study astrophysics and things in space that are huge or moving very fast and very great distances. Someone like me, I have to take a moment and I have to try to find a way to understand that and process. How does that make sense in what way to me? And so that's my kind of ear week. And then in trying to understand that stuff, that's how I start understanding and learning the differences between light years and astronomical units and stuff like that. It makes me happy. And then I try to tell Impossible. people in my life, hey, guess what I learned today? And they look at me and say, what does it have to do, you know, with Taylor Swift? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you can talk about meteors that are the size of eight Taylor Swifts, but uh, generally speaking, <laughs> those units are not going to be relevant unless you happen to be Aaron Reich. Uh, shout out to Aaron if he's listening. Um, so I'm hey, curious. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I, well, we, we've hit almost a thousand uh uh downloads um total so i I'm, haven't I'm... checked yeah almost at a thousand um, downloads i think we're almost at a thousand downloads um but but hopefully aaron is uh is one of those people um and aaron if you are listening we appreciate you and all of your silly science shenanigans of comparing uh asteroids to taylor swift's or to um uh washing machines um or comparing cool stars to the temperatures of cups of coffee. Um, but yes, no, the, the um, question I was going to ask you, Benjamin, with regards yes, to this like earworm of, of what is this thing? I need to understand it. Mm -hmm. I often um, have this, this debate um, with, uh, with my partner and, and with friends where it used to be the case that if you are out with people or you're, you're on a road trip and you're discussing something and you have some, some bit of information that somebody says that seems so fantastical that nobody believes it or nobody knows the answer and then you're all kind of uh, hypothesizing, what, hypothesizing what the answer could be. It used to be the case that you would kind of just have to think it out and come to some sort of reasonable logical agreement um, until you, you happen to get close to a library or you happen to get, you know, somebody who was an expert on the topic. And, and these days, because these days, the youths, um, you, you just look it up and you get instant gratification. And, and we can talk in a moment maybe about, you know, as part of the process of learning, how do we identify the differences between you know, what you can look up or, or what you can rely on when you're looking up these, these answers on the internet. But I don't know. Do you, do you feel like you, you're, you, you want to like just rip off that band aid and, and, you know, just like remove the earworm as soon as possible? Or do you try to think about it? Do you try to like logic your way to an answer before you, um, you know, reveal the answer by, by Googling it? I am not the biggest fan of American football. Trust me, I'm going somewhere. I'm not the biggest fan of American football. I've never missed a Super Bowl, but that's because, you know, I, I, I agree and I like being a part of society. But I'm not a big American football fan. And I went to a sports bar. That's called a pub, by the way, Kavi. I went oh, to a sports bar and with some uh, good friends of mine, and we were watching – uh, the sports ball on the TV and something terrific happened. I don't know what, I still don't know what the entire bar was brought to their feet, screaming and cheering popcorn. And everyone was very, very happy. And the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers did something. I don't know what. And my friend said, way to go. Mr. Irrelevant. And I thought, why did you call him that? Mr. Irrelevant. He just did something that caused mm. the whole place to go nuts. And then it was explained to me 
that uh, every year there's a foot, there's a draft for new players to enter the NFL. And the most sought after new prospect is chosen first. And the next guy is chosen second and on and on down the line until it gets to the very end. Someone has to be the last person chosen in every year's draft. And the nickname given to that person is Mr. Irrelevant because he's often not that good. He doesn't get to play. You're not going to expect any fireworks from this guy. Bottom of the ladder. But here we have Mr. Irrelevant on TV bringing the place to its feet. The place is exploding. He eventually went on and uh, played in the Super Bowl just a few weeks ago. They lost, but still. Mr. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. The lowest paid guy on that team. The lowest paid guy is leading the team. (laughs) That made no sense to me. And it was driving me crazy. And the game kept progressing. And everybody's cheering and commenting on, you know, more uh, uh, plays or whatever the hell they call it. I don't care. I don't know. I don't know much about the American football. And the whole time, I am just baffled (laughs) why did they call him this and why was he chosen dead last if clearly he's got it whatever it is Mm. and so that night uh i got home and hi everybody hi 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 wife hi kids i gotta go and i sat down and i started researching for days everything i could find about the nfl draft the nickname of mr relevant how does it come to be i started doing all the Counting every single person who's earned the name Mr. Relevant for the past 40, 50 years. And it turns out that name is not applicable. More than half of them end up playing professionally. Some of them have made it to the Hall of Fame. It's the stupidest nickname. <laughs> it clearly <laughs> bestowed upon people because there was no paying attention to the to the data. And that is... And that was like my most recent real big earworm type of thing. I had to learn. I had to understand. Everybody loves this thing. I, I don't so much. But it helped me understand more what other people like. And it was, it was great. Thank you for indulging my story. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It was a good story. I, I think it answered the like... question quite well as well. It's interesting. Like we don't often have that time to, to do a deep dive like you did to, to find the answer. And I wonder, like, there are definitely some things in life that I feel that same need that I just have to, I have to know and I have to like really deeply understand. I don't know. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed and I just have to like get a, a an approximate answer just to know roughly like what we're talking about. Um, yes. Because that's the only way that you can, you know, move on or make progress, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's tough. It, it's tough when you feel the need that you want to like learn everything because you have to start somewhere, right? Humanity would never be able to progress um, intellectually speaking, or, or you know, in terms of like the knowledge of all humanity, if every person had to learn all the things that all of humanity had learned until then. Right, you you kind of just create a rough picture in in elementary school and and high school and, and university if you go to university, um, and you you kind of get a rough framework on on what you know society or or the the board of education has decided are, are relevant topics, and you learn it in a very vague and approximate way of whatever's relevant, and 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 that's it, and then you just go on from there. It's 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 a wild idea to think about the fact that we're just relying on on that model of thinking and that model of learning. Yeah, there's no question there. It's just a it's a bit, yeah. bit of a head scratcher. <laughs> in, in, in all the 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 re, I'm saying research, being a bit generous of the word research, but in all the little preparation I was doing for this episode, um. Uh, I was listening to uh, Carl Sagan's episode on the original Cosmos, episode 11, The Persistence of Memory, which handles uh, 
memory and learning and and all the other articles i've read also cover also cover this exact same concept is uh a global consciousness where we are all learning as a species together we're all moving forward mm. with uh first with libraries and then with uh, uh um, uh, more like uh, after libraries uh, broadcasting and after broadcasting now the internet we have this great global uh, infrastructure of knowledge that we all share and something that always itches my brain is uh, we are all sharing this same global network of knowledge but what if in the preparations of that global network somebody made a mistake or two <laughs> Then we're all marching forward to uh, the same error. I've always had that in my head. Like, oh my God, I trust this calculator completely. Every time I type in a bunch of numbers and hit times and another bunch of numbers, it's going to give me the exact answer. I trust it completely. Uh, what if there's a little boo-boo in there and I don't know about it and I don't know to question it? That's in my head. <laughs> I mean, luckily there are enough people in society who... Um... Who, who really get that itch of the, the, of the earworm and they really need to know things on a deep level. And, and, you know, people are, I guess, refusing to accept common, commonly accepted truth as the truth. Uh, and there are enough of those people that, you know, stuff is being questioned and, you know, looking into how we can improve things and, and technologies. Um, you've reminded me of a, of a quote um, that I want to, I'll say this quote and then we can do our uh, ad break and then we'll go back to it. Um, but uh, it so so you know we're talking about the the, the problem with setting um, knowledge as accepted knowledge, and it reminds me of this quote from from Socrates that basically was talking about like the problem with writing is that people uh, it, like it will create a forgetfulness in in the souls of of people who want to learn because they're not going to use their memories and they're just going to trust the externally written characters and not remember themselves. Um, and there was this like whole idea that when when writing and the storage of knowledge in in books became commonplace, that it would like erode the foundation of education because people wouldn't have to remember things themselves. Um, yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll let that one stew with our audience maybe for a minute. I like that, uh, and I <laughs> like even more everybody that's listening that I inspired. Uh, Kavi to think about Socrates. Maybe you inspired Socrates to do that in some sort of weird time bendy way. Um, <laughs> I do have a DeLorean. Well, that actually, Benjamin, takes us to uh, this week's sponsor. Are you oh. tired of spending hours cleaning up your messy lab after failed experiments? Well, today we're introducing the Chronoceptor. This revolutionary device can rewind time up to 10 seconds, allowing you to fix your mistakes without the hassle. Spilled that priceless potion? No problem. Blew up your Bunsen burner? Chronoceptor it. Just remember, Chronoceptor is not responsible for the accidental time travel or alternative timelines. Use responsibly. The Chemist Chronoceptor, available in all major science supply stores, not liable for any temporal paradoxes. <laughs> <laughs> Not liable for temporal paradoxes. <laughs> <laughs> the I use this chronoceptor and my parents weren't born. Ah, says it right there. Not liable. <laughs> <laughs> you have people fading from existence in their complaints department. Like, bro, help. I need a refund. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> old chronoceptor chronoceptor oh well, thank you well, well, well done yes. well done <laughs> um back to our uh topic of this week's episode uh learning and memory um so i i feel like there were a few things that came up in your research that um you were ready and 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 waiting to to chat about um Sure. Because I feel like you you went you go deeper than I do on these uh, <laughs> on these preps. Just to scratch that. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I like to prepare and get some notes ready. Or Kavi just saunters in all hungover and just wings it. Uh, <laughs> you cannot <laughs> prove that. 
<laughs> uh, just to quickly summarize what happens in our brain uh, when we learn something, as we said just before we started recording, uh, basically, if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, your brain is, um, when you learn something new, uh, you have something called neural plasticity, which is your brain's ability to um, create new neural connections or uh, break neural connections, depending on if you're learning or not learning. If I teach you two different ways to do a task, you've created neural connections to do both of those ta that task two different ways. And, but then you start to favor one of those ways in time. Repetition, 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 repetition. Eventually, you can say that again. You, huh? I said you can you say that again. <laughs> I can say that again, repetition. You are strengthening those uh, synapses for that one t task, that you, the one way you're doing that task. But you're not performing the task that other way. And you're going to start to forget because as you don't do that thing, as your brain stops accessing that piece of information you put in there and how to do it, uh, the strength, the physical strength of that neural connection, the synapse in your brain starts to weaken. And that synapse could be, you know, lend itself to some other new piece of information or just not work for that piece of information anymore. And that's how you forget. So repetition, repetition, I can say that again, repetition, helps, stre <laughs> helps strengthen and helps build neuropathways. And not only that, but your brain is working in overdrive all the time. So not only do you remember in that scenario where I teach you two different ways to do a task, you're going to remember what led you to get to that place to learn those two different ways to get that task. And that connects, maybe you had a delicious blueberry pancake breakfast the day before that you learned those two different tasks. And that's why every time you do that task, somewhere in the back of your head, you have a craving for blueberry pancakes. It's because your brain is associating all sorts of experiences that are happening around it all the time. And that's how your brain kind of crisscrosses its neural pathways as you learn mm. it's actually an incredibly weird and super complex uh, uh venue for contextual learning or retrieval of information and it's 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 it is insane it's and that's just so a very very small part of it it's kind of reminding me of how um People would recommend when I was doing, you know, end of high school exams or exams in during undergrad, this idea of placing yourself in the same context when you're doing study or practice exams as that you will be in the actual exam. So, you know, uh, you ha we had these particular either bright blue or bright yellow exam booklets with with lined answer sheets to fill in the solutions. So, like you would do practice exams in those same booklets. You would use the same pen that you're planning to use if you had a particular snack. Um, like some people would even have like exam underwear. They would study for exams wearing this underwear. And like that would be the same thing so that you're basically maximizing the contextual map between the preparation and the exam itself. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the... Uh... Brains are weird. This is one of the uh, things that builds superstition, as a matter of fact, that because you're trying to put yourself in these specific contextual familiar areas, this is what I was doing when I was learning. This is what I was doing when I succeeded. This is what I was doing when I succeeded. You want to repeat that again. It's a very smart mm -hmm. thing to do. It helps you recall your, your footsteps. It helps you remember what you're doing. It helps put your mind in the proper mindset of studying or achieving something. And so that's how superstition comes to play every time i do this i'm wearing blue socks i need my blue <laughs> socks or i'm not going to be able to do this and that's how it goes it's it, it's a it's a it's a our, our brains have 
a lot of higher functioning regions, but they're mm-hmm. all directly connected to a lot of more base primary uh, uh, primitive functioning regions. So that's how those kinds of things inter- interact with each other. Yes, I understand, you know, all this high functioning reasoning that I'm doing and these calculations and art, but at the exact same time, I think it's because I was wearing blue socks. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's forwards and backwards. And, and in that regard, I think our brains are beautiful and delicious. Brains are beautiful. Oh, no, I don't know about delicious. Um, but brains are definitely beautiful and, and weird. And I think it's so, it's also fascinating to think about the fact that, you know, the brain has been a mystery for, 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 for thousands of years, right? Humans have been trying to figure this out from ancient Egyptians who would, you know, remove brains, uh, in the mummification process to, you know, Renaissance, uh, um, scientists and artists who would be like, you know, going through um you know human anatomy in a very physical way to try to understand it and even now as we get better and better at understanding brains we understand as you were saying that these neural pathways that are that are built that connect different regions of the brain they're basically just electrical pathways right like you have uh uh um these synapses um that have you know a receiving end and and ascending and an axon and a dendrite that are basically just sending an electrical signal over a, a, a small distance and like when you say it like that it sounds incredibly simple but it's not it's 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 a very strange thing to have and I think this goes back to what we were saying before. We understand approximately how it works, but we don't really understand in any sort of deep way. And I think that's one of the interesting things of about science and the scientific method is we're not, we never know things. We're just less wrong over time. Our approximations are getting maybe better and better at what's actually really happening in some sort of fundamentally true way, if that makes sense. Right. Right. Even with modern technology, um, <clears throat> scientists have been able to put uh, little receivers on uh, people's heads and put them through different series of questioning. And they're able to identify which regions of the brain handle which kind of thinking. But when it comes time to go into those regions and see what are the actual mechanisms of that thinking, how does the brain actually do this thinking? It's still uh, unknown to us. We know where it's happening. We know that uh, the left side is more analytical and the right side is more creative. We know that's where those things are happening. But when they do the deep dive into the actual inner workings of the left side, right side, what are they doing that's you know different from each other? As you just said, it's electric sparks traveling an incredibly small distance inside. And it's kind of hard to, you know, shove a camera (laughs) to people's brains to see what happens when they're they're thinking, you know, physics or sculpture. (laughs) It's like like physics. We know where it is. Biochemistry. It's awesome. Brains are fun. I think brains are fun. It, it kind of connects to this bigger point that I was talking about earlier um, of, you know, looking things up. Mm-hmm. And it's obviously very important to train your brain um, and to build these connections, to, to train your brain to recognize what a reliable source of information is. Um, so you have to be, you know, recognizing, okay, is this website where I'm getting this p- piece of information from a, a reputable um, you know, is it, is it a, a university website? Is it an academic journal? Is it, um, you know, maybe even something like Wikipedia, but it has, um, it's citing its sources and the sources are reputable. Or is it a website that talks about UFO conspiracies and has a bunch of weird ads that you don't recognize? And I, I think that's a really important thing to train your brain on. But not only that, I think that what we were saying before about approximate knowledge means that 
even if you do find your way to a reputable source, you still have to remember that that piece of information that you're getting is the best approximation of what humanity knows right now. And exactly. historically speaking, we improve our knowledge, we improve our accuracy, our resolution of understanding these things. But sometimes things change and the absolutely the accepted truth and the reliable truth is not going to be what it once was. That is true. That's for true. now. For now. <laughs> uh, we, we thought that... Uh, uh, what? That there were just a few stars in the sky. And then we learned that... Well, there's... Uh, we're we're in the, actually in a galaxy of stars. And then we learned that our galaxy is one of many galaxies. And then we learned our little group of galaxies is one of many groups of galaxies. And every time there's a... And every one of those things I just said, that was accepted as facts for a while until we learned something greater, something new. So absolutely, that's, that's the truth. And always, as I've learned with running science actually for a few years, always cite your sources. <laughs> if you don't, they're going to get you. They're going to come for you. <laughs> Uh, and yes, that is a great note to end on. If you are looking for a wonderful, reliable source of information uh, that cites its sources, um, where can where can people find science? Actually, I didn't know you were setting me up for that. That's very nice. Thank you, <laughs> uh, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of uh, Science Actually Presents: The Nerd and the Scientist. Uh, you can find me, the nerd, on all the social media platforms uh facebook twitter instagram threads hive mastodon linkedin under science actually and as i've been working on this for the last uh few days tiktok if you'd like to actually watch kavi and i do these wonderful recordings we are slowly uh converting the video into tiktok form that lovely vertical for your mobile phone tiktok form uh, you can watch all of us, uh, all of our, all of us, all of our episodes on the Ticker Talker. Enjoy, Kavi. Apart from seeing your gorgeous mug on Science Actually's TikTok page, where else can the people find you? Well, thank you, Benjamin. You're too kind. Um, <laughs> the good people and the bad people and the eh people can find me uh, at Fun Fact Science on. Uh, Facebook, uh, the artist formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, um, LinkedIn, YouTube, Blue Sky. Um, and you can also just Google me and maybe you'll find something interesting. Yeah, I think I've, I found a, um, a, a wiener dog on Instagram that has the same name as me. Um, yeah. It's strange. It's strange. There is a there is a dashed wiener dog out there whose name is Covey Rose. Uh, enjoy that fun little oh God, irrelevant tidbit. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy that fun little tidbit. Um, be sure to check us out online um, and and send us your thoughts and comments and positive feedback. Uh, tell your friends. Tell your wives. Tell your kids. Tell your dog. And <laughs> I can see that Benjamin's found the uh, wiener dog. And we 